Hey Integrity Church, thank you so much for joining us again on our live stream. I miss seeing all of y'all and I know we miss seeing one another, but it's our hope that while we're gathered in our homes during these really unprecedented times, that we would just take advantage of what God has before us. Uh, our families, our, our children, uh, we'll never forget these times. We'll never forget watching sermons on our laptops or our home televisions. And it's my hope that as we have these times that we really take advantage of, of really serving one another, serving our family, serving our children, uh, letting them hear uh, the beauties and the wonders of the gospel. And so my hope is that we, as we have these songs to sing in the moment or, or hear and listen to, and we open up God's word as families, as we go through the study guide, we would just really just lean into this time uh, that we have together. Before we move any further, I do want you to hear from Dave. Dave is our missionary that we sent to East Asia. Uh, they served faithfully, he and his family served faithfully in East Asia for three and a half years. And they had just come back because of COVID-19. And you all were so faithful uh, to serve their family. So I'd love for you to hear about how they're doing and how grateful they are uh, to be back and to see uh, all of you. Well, hello, Integrity. My family and I just want to give a big shout out to say thank you so much for the way that you have uh, been so faithful to pray for us and support us and to love on us over the last three and a half, almost four years as we've served in East Asia. And now that we've come back, even there was a food train of over 10 days, I know that there was many people that couldn't even sign up because it filled up so quick. We want to thank you so much. The, the meals were delicious and uh, you were so generous with the portions that I even have a freezer full of leftovers so I didn't have to prep as much for uh, the self-quarantining that we all have to do right now. And with that in mind, I know that this is a difficult time for all of you. Uh, we went through a lot of this already in Asia before we came back and are reliving it. Um, and we've learned through this time to just, this is a time to press into our faith, to, to the promises and truths that we know from Scripture. When Paul says, I don't consider uh, the sufferings this time to be compared to the glory that will be revealed to us, that is spot on for this time. You might be suffering, you, there might be so many unknowns right now. But we know where our hope is from. We know that uh, we're pilgrims in this world. This world is not our home. Heaven is. We're co-heirs with Christ. Well, we will reign with Him forever with great joy and excitement and adventures that are uncomparable to what we know in this world. As pretty as this place is, this is nothing compared to what God has for us. And that hope that we hold on to is precious to those around us, our friends and our family and our neighbors that don't know Christ. This is a great opportunity I would encourage you to do is to, if you can't see them in person, take a phone call, an email, reach out to those around you and ask how they're doing. Be willing to pray for them and to share the hope that you have in them. This is a, a, really a great opportunity both for the people in Asia and around the world where people are, are going to have a lot of questions and in their fear the Lord, I pray, will, will draw people to Himself. And I, I really hope this is not a lost opportunity for us, but one where we can press in and trust in the Lord and be bold to share the gospel and gather around in our, our homes and read the Bible together as, as families and pray with each other and uh, you know use devices like this to make videos and just connect with each other. So again, I want to say thank you all for what you've done. We look forward to seeing you all in person, and we pray that you would uh, connect with the Lord and be bold to share the gospel during this time. So good to hear from Dave, uh, and I echo everything that Dave said. This is a wonderful time for us to love one another. Uh, we see in the Word of God in Galatians chapter 6 that if we bear one another's burdens, we fulfill the law of Christ. And so it's an aw awesome opportunity for us to, to call each other on the phone, send encouraging text messages, 
uh, even love the, the Dave and May and their family and just encourage them in the gospel. Before we move forward, let me pray that God would be with us in this moment as we seek him. Father, we are so grateful that we do have this opportunity uh, to really learn from your word, uh, to grow together even though that we're scattered. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to to run to you in times of need, in times of trial. We would also run to other believers that we would be encouraged and be maybe even held accountable. Uh, maybe even, even times like this, we're afraid or we're angry, we're frustrated. Maybe, we're, maybe the quarantine is just stirring up uh, bitterness between husbands and wives or kids or whatever it is. Uh, I pray, Father, that we would confess those things to you. Maybe we even call a friend and, and, and just ask for help uh, in, in this time. Um, but you, that you would just meet us right now where we are. And God, we just ask this on, on your precious holy name, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Bid me taste and see 
thy glory be my rest, my hiding place. Yes, God, we pray that you would be our rest, that you would be our hiding place, that we would find ourselves wholly and completely in your gospel, redeemed by the work of your son. God, we're thankful that you have given us salvation, that you have given us a way to be with you in community for forever. And God, we, uh, we ask today that you change our hearts as we hear from your word, that you would convict us and move in our midst, even from our own living rooms, God, that you would speak to us today through your word with power. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Mark 15, verses 16 through 32 is where we'll be um, this morning. Now, many of us are at home more than ever, and perhaps you have gone through a cycle of different Netflix and Hulu shows or uh, documentaries or whatever it is that you're doing. One of my favorite shows uh, to watch in, in times like this when I'm sort of stuck at home more than often is Shark Tank. And if you're not familiar with Shark Tank, it's a, it's a show where you have entrepreneurs and people who are inventors of things and, or businesses, they come present in front of uh, well-known uh, businessmen and women. And so they go and present and they have to do a pitch, a sales pitch of an innovation or something creative they've done and put together. And I love it as someone who loves entrepreneurship. I, I love watching the Shark Tanks. I love watching new ideas. But I also love when people come and they try to give a pitch that's just not very good. And maybe they're kind of slimy businessmen and they're trying to get, uh, trying to manipulate a process or trying to sneak one by uh, these really sharp uh, businessmen and women and then they get kind of called out. And they get kind of called out on this scheme because it makes me begin to think, okay, what would it be like if I were to go and present an idea or something on Shark Tank? If I was smart enough to do something like that, I, I, would, I always wondered, how would I pitch it? How would I show this presentation of something I was really passionate about? And so the question I would ask you even today, how would you present something uh, that you care about that would change someone's life if they really were to, to buy into it or to believe it? How would you compel uh, someone to, to buy in to what you firmly believed? This is really the heart of what's happening in the Gospel of Mark. Mark is writing this letter, this book, to these, this Roman audience, and this Roman audience was a really hard audience. It was a hard audience to convince that Jesus Christ was really the Messiah. Mark knew this gospel. He knew of this Christ who, who came, and now he's trying to tell the Romans he's worth believing in. He is truly the one who came and died. Now, here's why the Romans had trouble believing in Jesus. The, the Romans were all about glory. The Romans believed in this whole concept of this. If, if he's really the Christ, he wouldn't have come from this podunk town, Nazareth. He wouldn't have uh, lived in obscurity in, until he was in his 30s. He wouldn't have hung out with fishermen and tax collectors. He, he wouldn't have come in the way that he did. He wouldn't have hung around with the Jews. The, the Romans would have looked down on the Jews. And then later they, they hear all these stories, they hear that he's done some of these miraculous things, some of the things that they even saw for themselves. And then Jesus was put to trial, and then Jesus was killed. And so then for the Romans, if he was really the king, he wouldn't have gone through this process. He wouldn't have gone through this humiliation. And so what Mark does as he writes this book to the Romans, this gospel account to the Romans, he's showing them that Jesus' humiliation is not something to be ashamed of. In fact, Jesus' humiliation is, is actually Jesus' glory, and Jesus' glory actually becomes our victory. 
And so Mark, as he's writing this story, he might not highlight at all times all of the heroic things that Jesus has done, even though, in fact, he does highlight many of the heroic things that Jesus does, many of Jesus' incredible, miraculous things that he did when he raised the, the dead or he healed the sick or he calmed the storm. All of these things that Jesus did were heroic, but Mark is not afraid to show some of the humiliating sides to Jesus. And what I want you to see today is that it's not Mark doing a poor sales pitch. In fact, it's Jesus' humiliation that is his glory. And what I want us to see is that his glory, his humiliation, his glory is actually our victory. And that's what we're going to pick up in Mark chapter 15. We'll start in verse 16. Now this is Jesus after he was betrayed. Jesus was Trialed, tr- tried before uh, Pontius Pilate, and now Pontius Pilate, who wants to uh, satisfy the crowds of the Jews who are bringing Jesus before him, sends him away to be crucified. And so we pick up in verse 16. It says, And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, and this is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put on him. And they began to salute him. Hail, King Jesus. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. It's astonishing reading these words about Jesus. When you think about where Jesus was before, Jesus was with the Father before he came into the world. He was with the Father. In fact, the Gospel of John in John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was Jesus, is what John is showing us. We see in Colossians chapter 1 that he was there in the beginning and that he holds all things together, that Jesus Christ holds all things together, that Jesus Christ was there when the world was created. He holds all things together. Uh, Hebrews says in chapter 1 of Hebrews that he is superior to, uh, above all things, including the angels, and yet we see him here humbling himself. Jesus is leaving his rightful place and coming to earth as a man. For what? For this? To to be an utter mockery before man? You see, everything that they do is for, um, to mock Jesus. You see the crown of thorns that's they, they've made to, to place on their heads. Now in eastern North Carolina, we think of a thorn bush. We think of little thorns this size. I've actually been uh, to, to South Africa, and I've seen thorn bushes, and there's thorns this big. I, I was playing soccer one time in Africa, and we kicked a ball into a thorn bush, and it flattened the soccer ball. And these thorns were, were maybe this long. Imagine it pushed into your, your head. This is what they did to the Lord Jesus to say that, okay, this is our king, mocking the Lord Jesus. They, they uh, put a purple cloak around him. They began to call him king. They began to salute him. And be, typically what you do when you would bow before a king is you would bow and then you would kiss the king. They, would, they bowed, and th- instead of kissing him, they spit on him. Throughout the Bible, there's this analogy that God uses to describe his power and control versus our power and control. And and it's this analogy that he is the potter and we are the clay. So I want you to think about that. This is Jesus Christ who holds all all things together. He's the creator of, of everything, the creator of even the soldiers who mocked him. And now you have him coming into human history and where the clay viciously attacks the potter. That's what's happening here. The clay is viciously attacking the potter. And look at what else happens. Verse 20 says, when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him 
and they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. Now it's interesting, a couple of things here that I want to point out. First of all, the cross, to, Jesus had to carry his own cross to his crucifixion. Now, it wasn't the whole cross. It was, it was known as really the cross beam that Jesus had to carry, the, the one that his arms would be tied to and eventually nailed to. And Jesus is carrying this cross beam, which was about 75 to 125 pounds. That's how heavy it would have been. And this doesn't seem like much, but after he had endured all of these beatings. Other gospel accounts show more of the torture that Christ had already endured at this point. And here he is carrying this cross beam, and he was going to see the, the rest of the beam at, as, at his crucifixion. And there you find a man who is named Simon. It says from Cyrene. Now Cyrene was a, a different location. And the reason why Mark is pointing this out is because he wants to show us this is not Simon Peter. Remember Simon Peter? Simon Peter was the one who told Jesus that, hey Jesus, I, I won't ever deny you. I won't ever forsake you. In, in, in fact, I'll die before that happens. And of course, we know that based on what we've seen that Peter was quick to deny Jesus that very day. And so Jesus, who's helping, the man who's helping Jesus is this uh, man from Cyrene, Simon and he's helping Jesus, and he's a stranger. Again, Mark is highlighting the loneliness and the rejection of Jesus. And we see that even in the location where Jesus was crucified. It says in verse 22, and they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. It's outside of the city walls. It's in obscurity. It's in isolation. Again, loneliness, rejection, isolation. All of these things are happening. All of these things to show the humiliation of Jesus. Verse 23, and they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Uh, wine and myrrh mixed was, was really to, to alleviate the pain of someone who would endure crucifixion, but Jesus did not take it. But then verse 24, it says, and they crucified him. And divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. Now we'll get into the time of why the third hour is important next week. But verse 24 to 25, Mark respectfully, he doesn't go into the details. He says, and they crucified him. Now, the reason why he doesn't go into the details is because crucifixion, people knew, especially the Romans, knew what that meant. The Romans regarded crucifixion as so shameful that it shouldn't be mentioned. The greatest Roman Republican, uh, the orator Cicero, wrote about a hundred years before Jesus that one shouldn't even think of crucifixion. He says, the very word cross should be far removed not only from the body of a Roman citizen, but from his mind, his ears, and his eyes. The Jewish historian Josephus called death by crucifixion the most wretched of deaths. Last week we even mentioned that the word, it was a word to describe the pain of crucifixion. It's the word that we use today, uh, excruciating, which means from the cross. This was a horrific death. It was done publicly, and it was done such a way to draw out pain as long as possible. Some say as, as little as five hours. Some say as much as a full day. This is, this is what was done to the Lord Jesus, this humiliating, excruciating death. Verse 26 it says, in the, in the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one at his right and, and one at his left. 
And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Now, I love the irony of this because they're saying, you who said that you would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, you can't even save yourself. Little do they know what's about to happen in three days. Of course, we'll know in just a few weeks uh, what that really means, that he's, that he's really a picture of the resurrection when he talks about the temple. He's going to resurrect his, his own body, that Jesus Christ would not be defeated here in this humiliation. Little do they know that, but also you see the chief priests. They're, they're the ones who tried to debate Jesus in the temple. They're the ones who plotted to kill them. Here they are. They've left the city, and they're coming out into the wild, out into obscurity, out into isolation to see Jesus be crucified just to make a special appearance to mock him and to make fun of the Lord Jesus. And then you get into verse 32 of more of what they said. They said, let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may, be, may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. So here's Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of all things, the potter being tortured and mocked by the clay, the innocent being reviled by the guilty. Remember, This happened under Roman authority, yet Mark, as he writes this message to the Romans, he's writing it in this way. They know that it happened like this, but Mark does not hold back the humiliating details of Jesus' death. Why? Well, obviously there's an easy answer to that we'll talk about in just a few weeks, that Jesus is going to resurrect That's the pinnacle. That's everything. That's where the story really changes. But there's another reason why Mark is not afraid to show us the shame and humiliation of Jesus. That there's nothing to hide of the shame of of the cross. In fact, it was the glory of Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul talks about this in Philippians chapter 2 verse Five, he says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Therefore, he's saying, Paul's saying, God, Jesus being in the form of God, Jesus being one with the Father, Jesus being in heaven with the Father is not a thing to be grasped. He's willing to leave it for us. And this is why Paul says in verse 7, but Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, because of all this humiliation that Christ endured for us, all this shame, he says, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What did the Father do in Jesus' shame and humiliation? The Father glorified his Son. His son is the most recognized person in human history. The most recognized name above every name that has ever existed. This is what the father did for the son. This was Christ's obedience. And that led to his glory. Through Jesus' death, we see his victory. But it's not just the shame for his glory but it's also for us. It's also our victory. 
Uh, Peter talks about this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. He says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. He says, by his wounds, we have been healed. Now, Peter, of course, is, is referencing Isaiah chapter 53. And Isaiah chapter 53 is a picture of this Savior to come, this Messiah to come. And the Messiah, the way that Isaiah talks about the Messiah is that the Messiah would come not in this heroic way like the Romans would anticipate a king would come, but, but a one who would come that is despised and rejected. Look at Isaiah chapter 53. I'll start in verse 2. It says, For he grew up before him like a young plant. It's talking about Jesus. Like a root out of a dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted, acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. And we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus came in, the, in this form to be despised, to be rejected, to be humiliated, to be shamed, so that we would no longer carry shame ourselves, so that we would not be rejected by our very creator. Shame is such a powerful thing. Shame can, can almost control us. Shame can almost ruin us. What comes to your mind when, when, I, when I'm bringing up the word shame? What's the word, what's the thing that has happened to you or that's been done by you, that's been done to you? Or maybe, maybe it's just the sin that, that you've done. Or maybe the sin that's happened to you. Or maybe the sin that just exists because we live in the fallen world that has brought shame upon you. It might just be something that you've, that you've committed in your past or maybe even in your present. Maybe it's something that you're hiding. Uh, maybe it's something that someone has done to you. Maybe harming you physically or emotionally or spiritually. Uh, maybe it's just the shame that we have because we live in a falling world. Think something that we're embarrassed about. Maybe it's so we don't think we're attractive enough or smart enough or we, we're, we can perform enough. We, we're not good enough at work. We're not good enough at sports. We're not good enough in, in the classroom or at school. Maybe it's just this thing that consistent, consistently lingers that just tells us that, we're, that we don't have, we, we're not enough. We're unlovable. We're unworthy. Uh, we don't have what it takes. We're too sinful to receive God's grace and God's mercy. Shame is such a powerful thing, and it's one of Satan's greatest devices that he uses to try and destroy us. We see shame the first time in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sin. And what happens when they sin? Well, the Bible tells us that they cover themselves. They try to cover themselves, and they try to hide from God. This is the first time we see shame happen. The interesting thing is right before that event takes place in Genesis chapter 3, the very end, the very last verse of Genesis chapter 2, it says, Adam and his wife were both naked, and it says they felt no shame. Imagine a world. We feel no shame. We have nothing to hide. We have nothing to be afraid of about ourselves. This is what Jesus did. This is why Jesus came. This is why Jesus died the most shameful way possible. He did so so that we would not feel alone. He did so 
so that we, he would be with us in our shame. In fact, he did so so that he would bore, that he, because he bore our shame so that we wouldn't have to live in shame. So we don't have to believe the lies of the accuser. So we don't have to constantly be, be, live in believing that we're unworthy or unlovable or unforgivable. This is what Jesus did for us. This is why Jesus came despised and rejected. And he died in our place. He died in our place not only giving us an inheritance that we would receive in Christ in our eternal life with him forever, but he died in our place. He also bore our shame so that we would live free from shame. Friends, Jesus' shame is our victory. This is why he endured the cross in this humiliating way on our behalf. This is why Mark is not afraid to talk about the humiliation of Christ. This is what he did because he loved you and me. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers who ever lived, in my opinion, uh, he talks about this idea of Jesus' atonement, Jesus dying in our place, how it bore our shame. And I'm going to read just different parts of his sermon on this. He said, When I stand in my own place, I am lost and ruined. My place is the place where Judas stood, the place where the devil's lies and ever, and he lies in everlasting shame. But when I stand in Christ's place, and I fail to stand where faith has put me till I stand there, when I stand in Christ's place, the Father's everlasting beloved one, the Father's accepted one, him who the Father delighteth to honor, when I stand there, I stand where faith hath a right to put me. And I am in the most joyous spot that a creature of God can occupy. I love that. When we don't live in shame, we're in the greatest spot, the most joyous spot that a creature of God can occupy. Well, he continues. He said, Jesus, he wore my crown, the crown of, glory, the crown of thorns. I wear his cr crown, the crown of glory. He wore my dress, he says. Nay, rather, he wore my nakedness. When he died upon the cross, I wear his robes, the royal robes of the king of kings. He says, he bore my shame. I bear his honor. He endured my suffering to this end that my joy may be full and that his joy may be fulfilled in me. He says, he laid in the grave that I might rise from the dead and I might dwell in him and all his he comes again to give me to make it sure to me that all, uh, that, all that love is his appearing to show that all his people shall enter in their inheritance. That's Charles Spurgeon on Jesus dying for our shame. Church, aren't you thankful that Jesus didn't hide the shame of the cross? The fact that he didn't hide it calls us not to hide our shame. It calls us it calls us out of our shame and into the light, out of the darkness of our shame and into the light of the glory of God and to our victory from shame. And so let me ask you, where is your shame? Where's your shame? Have you brought your shame before the throne of grace? When I asked you about shame, what's the first thing that came to your mind? What, what did you think of? And my, my question is, why is it still there? Now, I'm not asking you that question to shame you, of course. I'm asking that question because I want you to see why, what, how your shame is relating to the gospel. How have you applied the gospel to your shame? And so my hope that we would run to Christ with our shame, that we would see Christ as the one that Isaiah 53 talks about, that he is a God who is acquainted with grief, 
that he's acquainted with our sorrows, that he bore our shame so that we might, uh, be, might be back in the way it was in the garden when we were naked, when we were free, when we were unashamed. Church, might that, that be us today? Might we run to, not away from Christ, but to Christ with our shame, with our burdens, with our grief? And might it be, as Proverbs says, healing to our flesh and refreshment to our bones. And so wherever you are today in your home, may you bring before the Lord Jesus your shame. Say, Lord, this is what I'm afraid of. This is what I'm ashamed of today. This is a sin that I carry. This is a sin done by me. This is a sin done to me. This is a sin that I carry because we live in a fallen world. These are the insecurities. These are the things that embarrass me. Maybe you would even share that with a brother and sister. Maybe you would call someone today and say, you know, I was listening to the message, and I, I know you were as well. Would you just help me in, in this season as I'm, I'm wrestling with this thing that I'm so ashamed of? Would, this, would the shame of Jesus Christ draw you out of your shame? And, and would you come to him as a man of sorrows who's acquainted with your grief, as the one who's a high priest who sympathizes with our weaknesses? And would, our, would we bring our shame before him? And would we experience the grace and the mercy that he offers? And that's why he went to the cross to relieve us from our shame so that we have victory in the gospel. God, help us. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. We thank you for bearing our shame. And we come to you now, wherever we are, we come to you now boldly because you died in our place. And Lord, we know that you are faithful and you're gracious to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness when we come to you. You promise us that. So God, will we come boldly, knowing that you went before us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning I invite you to respond to the good news of the gospel in three different ways. Uh, first, we're gonna hear songs that remind us of the gospel. It's my hope that you would sing or maybe reflect on the words of the songs today. Secondly, I'm going to invite you to give sacrificially and generously. It, my hope is that you are listening and you're a, a, a member of Integrity Church. And if you're not a member of Integrity Church, we're just glad that you're listening. We, we really don't want your money. We're just glad that you're listening. We hope that you can respond to the gospel today. Perhaps you're not a believer and you, you would like to know what it's like to, to be a believer in Christ. And if that's the case, let us know. You can email us at info at liveintegrity.org. We'd love to answer any questions that you have for us about anything that you heard today. But if you call yourself uh, a member of Integrity Church or you uh, call Integrity Church your home, we're going to invite you to give sacrificially and generously. There'll be ways that you can do that in, in just a moment that will prompt you to do that. The last thing I invite you to do, if you're at home and you have the opportunity to do this, that you would remember Christ through the Lord's Supper. We do this at Integrity every week, and we do that through bread and through juice. If you are at home and you have those elements, or if you have wine or whatever it is that you have, that you would remember Christ today, that you would take the bread and the bread would help remember the shame of Jesus Christ when his body was broken on the cross. When you take the bread and you dip it in the cup, would you remember the crown of thorns that was placed on Jesus' head? Would you remember the blood that was shed when nails were driven through his hands and through his feet? Would you remember that that blood was shed for you? That blood was shed for you so that you would no longer have to live in shame. And this is the hope that we have in Christ. So my hope is that we would remember the gospel as we respond. Crimson 
Before we close out this morning, I just want to give you a couple of announcements. Um, first, I want to let you know that we have put together a study guide that goes along with today's service. Uh, it includes questions um, that you can go over with your family and friends, as well as some things to pray for this week. Um, and if you're a parent of Integrity Church, there's a link on the study guide that'll send you over to our Parents of Integrity Church Facebook page, where Joy will be putting out some content from the Gospel Project that you can go over with your kids. Um, again, that study guide can be found on our website as well as our app. And if you're watching today's broadcast on YouTube or Facebook, the link for that study guide will be in the description. 
Um, the second announcement I have uh, is for those of you that make donations on Sunday mornings typically, uh, we ask that you just transition those um, gifts to our online giving platform during this time. Um, and if you're used to writing checks on Sunday mornings, um, you can still make those out to Integrity Church and just mail them in to our address at 569 Irish Lane. Um, again, thank you guys so much for joining us this morning. I know this is a little different than how we typically do things at Integrity, um, but we just uh, wanna thank you guys so much for your support that you've sent us this week and encouragement. Uh, it means a lot and we want you to know that we all miss you guys dearly and can't wait to see you guys again in person. Uh, I hope you guys have a great week. Take care.